Good morning. Hello. Just going to move that back. It's amazing that so many of you are here. I'm thrilled. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, I'll just second what Clemency said. It's really wonderful to see so many of you here. Uh, and my gosh, I can't believe it's been so long. Um, but let's hope this is like riding a bike uh, and that my first keynote in quite a long time will uh, feel like riding a bike. So thank you. Um, I'm here to talk about battles today. Uh, I, I got this concept. Is Conrad here? Conrad Henson. There he is. Conrad Henson. I had lunch with uh, Conrad a few times over the last uh, couple of years between lockdowns, right? There were these times between lockdowns where I would meet up with people in the industry. And uh, Conrad said to me uh, one day over lunch, um, we're in a battle for the soul of damn, was the expression that he used. And I said, you know, that is a really great expression. And that is what inspired uh, this keynote. Um, I decided to use heart because uh, just the, the sort of ideas that came to me were more about heart than they were about soul. But I'm going to talk about battles today and, uh, and why we're in a battle right now um, to save damn for all that it is. Uh, a little bit about me. I think I've probably met about half of you in the room before, maybe, uh, maybe more of you. Uh, I help companies with marketing technology strategy. I help them uh, pick marketing technology solutions, implement them, and optimize them uh, over time. Um, these are a bunch of my current and recently past clients. I wrote a book about DAM in 2016. Uh, it actually feels quite old now since I wrote that book. Uh, but I've been working in DAM for about 18, 19 years now. And I started my career uh, in 1995 building a website by hand for a newspaper. Uh, and then that, of course, morphed into content management technologies. So I've been working in this world for a long time. So uh, we all did a lot of things during uh, the last few years that we wouldn't have had time for otherwise, didn't we? Uh, my first hobby was I, I decided I was going to learn to play the cello. So I bought a cello and uh, played very poorly and learned how to uh, play a few songs, basically, when I was you know, on YouTube and, and took some instructions that way. The other thing that I focused on last year was I spent a lot of time studying for the British citizenship test. Uh, I live here in London, and I've been here long enough now to become a citizen. And so I decided, well, I'm going to be studious, and I'm going to pass this test, and I'm going to make myself worthy to stay in this country. So there's an amazing amount of resources to study for this test. And of course, as many people will tell you who have studied for this test, it's full of extremely obscure information about kings and queens and history and things that are not particularly relevant, like what is the name of the fifth wife of Henry VIII? And this is the kind of questions that are in the test. Now, I had to study very, very diligently for this test. And I found a lot of uh, different tips. There's websites all over the place that sort of tell you what you should do, how you should prepare, and what the different topics are. So these are some of the topics in the test. The principles and values of the UK, uh, the long and illustrious history of the UK. There's an incredible amount about the Tudors and the Stuarts, of course. Uh, a lot about how the UK government works and many, many other sorts of topics. But there was probably uh, my favorite tip when I, was, when I was studying was that you should not study the day before the test. And I don't know if some of you know this. There's, a, there's also a rule in, in France that the, the politicians aren't actually allowed to campaign for the, a few days before the actual election happens. It's almost like you're supposed to sit and reflect and think you know, about what you've learned rather than continue to study and cram until the last minute. Anyway, I followed all the tips. And fortunately, I'm very pleased to announce I passed the test. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I am now one of the Queen's subjects. Um, <laughs> and I have to say that the, the thing that I felt stuck in my head more than anything else was a history of battles. And of course, when you study British history, you learn an incredible amount about battles. Who was the general? How long did it take? What were the techniques they used, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the, the one that I probably learned about more than anything else, of course, was the Battle of Hastings which, of course, was a monumentally important battle um, in the history of this country. And I, I went to battle, of course, because for a period of a year and a half, I couldn't really go anywhere particularly far. So I decided as I was studying, well, let's go see some of these places where these battles took place. Got in the car one day and drove to battle. The Battle of Hastings was not actually in Hastings, as I'm sure many of you know. It was in the area around what is now called battle. Now, for those of you who perhaps are not so familiar, maybe you don't remember because it's been so long since you studied British history. Uh, the, the, the basically completely changed who was in charge. Harold, who uh, there is the image from the Bayeux Tapestry, very famous image where uh, he gets killed. Uh, this was, of course, William the Conqueror. Now, 
William the Conqueror, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, was French. And one of the ironic things, of course, that I find, having lived here now for so long, is just how much the, the, the British like to, of course, make fun of the French and sort of pick on the French. And, and yet, when I studied for the test, I actually learned that basically the, the French sort of took over, right? And, and they started to borrow, in fact, William the Conqueror, of course, um, he brought all of his language in, right? And all of these words that we, we think about as English words like accuse and asset and crime and evidence are actually accuse, crime, evidence, parlement, robe. They are all French words. And actually, the British government spoke French for many, many generations after that. And many of the words that we borrow, my absolute favorite there, the last one, the exchequer, which I still can't pronounce that quite correctly, of course, all came from the French. So as a result of battles, we learn a lot, right? People come in, they take over, they dominate, and they let us borrow things or they impose things even more aggressively. And this is what I see happening in the dam industry today. There's vendors coming in that are sort of taking over, and in many ways, they want to oppress dam, they want to impose their own language, and they sort of want dam to sort of fade into the countryside. Now, what causes battles? Well, desire for territory. Risk was my favorite game as a child. Loved it. Risk and monopoly. It's no surprise now that I'm a businesswoman, I guess. I like to sort of <laughs> move around and manage things. Uh, misunderstandings, of course. People thinking in different ways. Greed. Power grabbing. Right? We're seeing this today in the world a lot disagreement about what something really is, the heart and soul of something. I think one of the most shocking moments over the last couple of years is when I started to see the developers of the software products, projects and products that I use with my clients going to battle in Ukraine. Right? Why is this happening? It's happening because of dominance. It's happening because of oppression. It's happening because people want to take over. Right? People want to take over and they want to take land and territory for themselves. That was a post that really, really shocked me, the developers of Magento, a long time content management project uh, going to war. So what's happening in our industry? Well, on a less serious note, and by no means you know, taking the, the, the sovereignty of nations lightly, um, but DAM itself is under threat. It's under threat of being completely consumed by the rest of the marketing technology industry. So here are the overtakers. <laughs> Okay, these are the ones that are really taking over now, right now. And they are just gobbling up, gobbling up, gobbling up lots of other vendors. Some of these logos I had to go back and find. That media bin logo, oh my gosh, did I have a hard time finding that one? That's the media bin logo from uh, I think 2001 or 2002. Okay, so all the vendors on the left have acquired vendors on the right. And my personal opinion is that many of the vendors on the left don't really understand or have as much comprehension of what DAM is and what it's really about and its sovereignty and what it really means. And I'll tell you, I had proof in the pudding very recently. I'm not gonna say which vendor because I'm not in the business of embarrassing people, but somebody from one of the vendors on the left <laughs> said to me recently, well, you know, we bought a DAM vendor and you know, I don't really understand the difference. We just put it in the content management category. Isn't it just content management? Doesn't it just, doesn't it just go into content management? Isn't it just the same thing? Is it really any different? Is DAM really different from that ECM thing we used to do, that enterprise content management, that document management? How is it really different? And then he asked me what a taxonomy was. <laughs> so, what do we do? What do we do? Is DAM really still that important? Or should we just buy everything from one vendor? and think it's gonna do DAM perfectly well. Well, DAM, the heart of what DAM is, hasn't changed. And it's still very, very, very important. This is the core of DAM graphic. This was put together with some of my friends at ICP, one of the sponsors, there's many people here from ICP today. Uh, and it's still about managing our rich media. I still like that term, rich media. It is what has grown and it is what has enriched our internet experience over the years. It's what has made the internet better. <laughs> it is media. 
It is virtual reality, it is imagery, it is branding, it is what builds, it is the foundation of our customer experiences, damn. And it's still about the core of making sure we have our assets in a centralized place, well tagged, well categorized, and accessible, not just by people, but by other systems. And that is perhaps the biggest transition that we have made and are making in digital asset management today. DAM is not just about a person or your brand managers or people in your organization going into a system and sort of finding what they need and using it. It is about every system in your enterprise being able to do that, being able to access it, using an API, pulling what it needs, and dynamically targeting to customers, building that experience, being foundational to that experience. So what DAM is at the core is still what it's always been, and it's still equally important. However, this is where we are today. <laughs> so if you're not familiar with this graphic, this is uh, Scott Brinker's graphic. He is the chief MarTech. So if you don't read the chiefmartech.com, you should. All damn practitioners should read it. And uh, this is a giant graphic of all the marketing technology out there. And this one is from 2020. Okay, the reason I've chose the one from 2020 rather than the one that was just published is because the recent one does not fit on a slide. I mean, this doesn't really fit on a slide. It's ridiculous. You can't see. But these are all these are all vendor logos. Okay, this is different categories of marketing technology. These are different vendor logos. And in 2020, uh, there was 8,000 solutions. In the latest version, there was 9,000 plus solutions, almost 10,000 solutions. So marketing technology is vast. It is massive. It is getting bigger. And they many of these vendors, they sell damn. That's what they say they do. They think they do because they can hold images and they can put some metadata around it and they think DAM is just that. And they tell you that they sell DAM and they think DAM is just that. Here is the category for DAM vendors on this graphic. Note, it is DAM, PIM, and MRM all in one category <sighs> as if they're the same. For those of you who don't know, PIM is product information management. MRM is marketing resource management. Very, very different pieces of functionality. Very, very different things. For those of you who attended the recent uh, five-part series with Henry Stewart online about DAM and PIM, you surely learned how different PIM is from DAM. And yet, this is what the marketing technology industry does. It just sort of buckets it all into one thing, as if DAM is just kind of part of other stuff. It's not particularly important. So what should we do? Why has this happened? Why has this happened? A, B, C. A, always B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. A, I, D, A. Attention, interest, decision, action. Attention. Do I have your attention? Interest. Are you interested? I know you are, because it's fuck or walk. You close or you hit the bricks. Decision. Have you made your decision for Christ? action. A-I-D-A. -A. Get out there. You got the prospects coming in. You think they came in to get out of the rain? A guy don't walk on the lot lest he wants to buy. They're sitting out there waiting to give you their money. Are you going to take it? Are you man enough to take it? <laughs> Sales culture can be extremely toxic. I, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, this segment. This is from the great, great sales movie, Glen Gary, Glen Ross. Uh, it was originally a play, and it is all about salespeople. If you have never seen it, I highly recommend you watch it. I first watched it when I was about 25 years old. I was taking my first sort of stint as a sales engineer working at a systems integrator, and we closed a big deal. I was invited into a room. I, of course, was the only woman in the room, a bunch of very high-powered men, and the head of sales pulled out a bottle of Jack Daniels from his desk, poured us all shots. And I hate whiskey, but of course, what did I do? I took the shot. And I became a part of the boys' sales club. And let me tell you, that's exactly what it's like. <laughs> you sell it. It doesn't matter if it fits. You sell it. It doesn't matter if it's the right choice. You sell it. It doesn't matter if the prior really doesn't fully understand what they're buying. It's just they think they need this thing. They think they need it, and you come up with the story to sell it. You have to be a skeptic. 
especially if you're about to spend half a million dollars on something that is actually not a dam, but they say they do dam. Be a skeptic, because this is often, sadly, what the sales culture is like. So the question then becomes, shall we go quietly into the MarTech stack? Shall we just fade back? Shall we just say, well, you know, what should we do? Dam, commodity. It's all over the place. Diminishing distinctions between vendors and tools. There's a lot of places you can put your images these days. There's a lot of places you can put metadata these days. Do we really still need DAM? DAM functions are generally getting subsumed by other marketplaces. I mean, you can buy Adobe Experience Manager. It does pretty much everything you need. It's got a DAM in it. Do I need something separate? Right? DAM vendors are consolidating. That's happened even recently. Photoware bought uh, PictureSpark. You know, at least, at least they're both DAM vendors. They understand what each other does. But still, DAM vendors are getting consumed, consolidated. DAM vendors are expanding into other domains even to survive. DAM practitioners are often split into sort of niche specialists or more generalized kind of marketing technology staff. And omni-channel platforms and composable digital experience stack sounds a lot cooler than DAM does, doesn't it? <laughs> we need to buy all of these very fancy things. So what should we do? Shall we stand and fight? I see in your eyes the same fear that would take the heart of me. A day may come when the courage of men fails, when we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship. But it is not this day. An hour of wolves and shattered shields when the age of men comes crashing down. But it is not this day. This day we fight. By all that you hold dear on this good earth, I bid you stand, men of the West! Of course, one of the greatest kings in English history, Aragorn. <laughs> Let's face it. <laughs> Let's face it. Definitely one of the most attractive. Um, much better looking than Henry VIII. Let's, let's face it. Uh, so, of course, the, the, you know, they're coming. The orcs are coming. <laughs> they're coming. They're coming through the gates of Gondor, and they are invading our territory. And we feel outnumbered. You know, we feel outnumbered. Uh, but we should. We should stand and fight. Right? We, should, we should be like uh, the, great, the great riders of Rohan. And we, we should stand, and we should fight, and we should defend Dam for what it is, because it is extremely important. Uh, so the invaders are here. This is what's kind of nice about invasions, is that stronger identity and strength often arises as a result of threats. So when we think about adjacent systems and vendors and invaders coming from a different worldview, they rarely try to understand the full benefits of another's independent existence. It's like, well, OK, what does Putin think? He doesn't think Ukraine should be independent. You know, I mean, it's kind of like, it's, it's sort of like coming in and saying, well, you know, Scotland, that's just like England, right? <laughs> Definitely not. DAM is not just like content management. DAM is not just like PIM or MRM. It is very unique, it is important, and it has its own strengths. And of course, there is, however, we can coexist, we can co habit, I should say. We should coexist peacefully. And if, you know, if I may think of some of the better examples of this that aren't necessarily perfect, but let's let's think about this. There can be strength in a larger population with shared values without sacrificing our sovereignty. We have a lot of shared values with the MarTech stack. We have a lot of shared values with other industries and other aspects of marketing. But the marketing stack, unfortunately, is still a very poorly conjoined semi-alliance. And it struggles with different aims and ideals, just like we do in the UK, just like Europe does, just like God knows the United States. Right? But we are still meant to work together. What do we need to do? We need to sh determine what our shared ideals are. We need to create unifying laws, things like shared metadata, governance models. We need to preserve our individual identities. We need to understand what a best of breed technology is fully. What should it do? How should it operate? How should it coexist and cooperate with others? I, I, one of the most fascinating things I learned when I was studying for the British citizenship test is what the individual UK nations are allowed to do versus what is you know, at, the, at the UK level or at the GB level, right? And there's, there's certain things you can let 
independence happen in certain groups, but then there's things that are decisions that are better made together. Right? We also need to respect boundaries, let people and tools do what they're best at, and gosh, we need to share budgets, don't we? How frustrating is this? It is so frustrating. <laughs> right? Because you can have the department that's paying for the dam, you can have the department that's paying for another piece of technology, the PIM. You can have a department that's paying for uh, the web content management tools, the e-commerce system. And you know what? We're never going to bring this together in a unified stack if we don't all share the budgets. We don't say, oh, we're going to have a MarTech group working together. And there's going to be a damn specialist on that team. And we're all going to come together and we're going to make this happen. Otherwise, it doesn't work. You know, why does the, the European Union is able to operate? Because they share budgets. Oh, wait, sorry, I won't make any comments. No more political comments. OK, so I will show my unified MarTech stack image. This was a, a graphic that a um, very smart gent called Tom Sloan, who's with ICP, and I put together uh, a few years ago when we were working for a large UK manufacturer. And uh, we, they, they just wanted sort of a vision, like, where are we going? Where does DAM fit in? And the important thing is that DAM is at the heart of this ecosystem. Look at this. <laughs> OK, so we think about DAM. And what users need to do, what marketing users need to do, it, it's all tied in this, this, this heart of, of our ecosystem. Okay? And it is about DAM working with product information and digital rights, and it's coming together at the center, and we should be able to collaborate, and we should be able to, to create uh, campaigns and, and manage creative projects, and we should have our different brand portals and our different ways of experiencing all this. But DAM is still at the heart, and all of the information that's coming in is part of that from our legacy systems, and all the different presentation layers that we're building, all the different parts of the customer experience comes from that, is built from that. You know, we're all working towards the same thing. We're all working towards the same thing. I could talk about this slide for ages. I think I did yesterday in the tutorial, but i um, happy to answer questions about it later. So leadership is extremely important. Now, just to start summing up here, leadership is extremely important. This morning, God gave us a great victory. But it is nothing compared to what he is ready to give us now. I know you are all tired and hungry, but I swear to you that even if these English were hanging from the clouds by their fingertips, we would pull them down before nightfall. Now. Let all those who love me follow me. Yeah! Leadership is often the unlikely one, just like Joan of Arc. And empathy is very important as well. One of my favorite lines from that Aragorn speech is, you know, I see in your eyes the same fear that might take the heart of me. All right, you have to have that empathy with your team, with your colleagues. And if you're going to rise to a leadership position and you're going to bring together these different parts of the stack, if you're going to be the great orchestrator of battles, hopefully not battles, but more like peace, let's say that. <laughs> if you're going to be the orchestrator of peace in the MarTech stack of your organization, you need to be a great leader and you might be the unlikely leader as well. So. It's time to rise to the occasion. Of course, you are the heart of Dan. Maybe you predicted the end of that story, but it's true, right? You're the heart of Dan. It's not the system. It's not the vendor. It's not whatever. It's you. You're the one that has to bring it together. You need to be an advocate for shared beliefs and values. Build a sense of unity with your team. You need to clearly define who you are and how you interact with your neighbors in a peaceful and collaborative way. Define the dams and your team's borders very clearly. What should the dam system do? What should the other systems do? One of the biggest issues we have is that everybody sort of has overlapping systems. I mean, a lot of these systems have overlapping functionality. And that's why vendors just sort of throw them into one category. Okay? But you need to define, you need to sit down, and you need to say, you know what? Well, this is what the PIM's going to do. This is what the dam's going to do. This is what the CMS is going to do. This is what the e-commerce system is going to do. Because if you just let everybody kind of do their own thing, there's going to be a lot of overlap, and there's going to be a lot of sloppiness. 
So define the borders. Avoid the conflicts of the past uh, to achieve a greater unified whole. So we need to come together as a team. We need to come together as a MarTech stack. And who said it better than Al Pacino? Three minutes to the biggest battle of our professional lives all comes down to today. Either we heal as a team or we're gonna crumble. Inch by inch, play by play, till we're finished. You find out life's this game of inches. So is football. Because in either game, life or football, the margin for error is so small, I mean, one half a step too late or too early, and you don't quite make it. One half second too slow, too fast, you don't quite catch it. The inches we need are everywhere around us. Hell yeah. They're in every break of the game, every minute, every second. On this team, we fight for that inch. On this team, we tear ourselves and everyone else around us to pieces for that inch. We claw with our fingernails for that inch. Because we know when we add up all those inches, that's gonna make the fucking difference between winning and losing. You gotta look at the guy next to you. Look into his eyes. Now I think you're gonna see a guy who will go that inch with you. Hell yeah. You're gonna see a guy who will sacrifice himself for this team because he knows when it comes down to it, you're gonna do the same for him. That's a team, gentlemen. Now, what are you gonna do? Probably one of the most inspirational speeches from any movie, I think. Uh, it's relevant regardless of what you're thinking about. It doesn't matter if you feel like you're fighting a battle at work, doesn't mean like you're fighting a health battle, a mental battle, whatever it is. Life is a game of inches, right? And even though you feel like you're working on a cathedral project that you might never see the end of, because you're gonna have to pass it to the next generation, whatever it is, every inch matters, right? Every day matters, and every little piece of progress we make matters. So Work hard, be inspired, and do it for your team. Work together, come together as a team, come together as a stack as well. Thank you very much, cheers.